Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. And uh, we've been going through, if it's your first week here, welcome. Uh, we've been going through a, a series of sermons about Genesis. And Genesis, very first book in the Bible, like, like Jim said, there's people who are trying to read their Bible through in a year, and everybody starts often in Genesis. And so maybe these are stories you've went through, and if they're not, I think they're stories that are, that are worth knowing about. We've, we've talked about Noah and Abraham, and we've tried to hit some of the, the high points of that book, and, and we want to do that again today and, and talk about uh, Isaac and, and Rebecca and Jacob and Esau and, and, and how God made them wait and, and, the, and the value, uh, believe it or not, of, of, of waiting. Um, John Ortberg, a long time ago, he did a sermon. I remember hearing it, and, uh, and he talked about that life uh, could be put into two boxes, there's, there's living or real living, you know, the, the, what you hope to do and, and what you dream of, and there's living, and then there's waiting to live. And, um, and the waiting to live box is a lot bigger. You think about a family trip where you're going someplace for vacation, or, or, uh, and, and so you're in the car for 10 hours as you're trying to get to the beach, or 12 hours or 15 hours, depending on which beach you're going to, and you're trying to get to the beach, and the kids are in the back, and they're dying, how much longer, and, and there's fights breaking out, and, and it just seems like it takes forever, and as you're waiting to live, it's this long, 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 long trip as we're trying to get there, and hopefully we'll get there soon, and, or you think about preparing a meal, and, and all the work that goes into preparing the meal, buying the right groceries, and, and all the preparation, and a lot of times it's, it's kind of lonely there in the kitchen by yourself, or, or just one or two people working on it, and you're, you're doing it because you know when everybody's here, we're going to want this meal, and won't that be great, but in the time of preparing, it can just be awful. Uh, Ortberg, in his sermon, talked about an amusement park. And, uh, and that, had, that you really see that there. And I looked up just to kind of get it in my head. Disney tells you that from the time you park your car until you get into the park, you should plan on at least 45 minutes of waiting just to get in uh, to Disney World. Once you're into Disney World, you should count on an average of 37 minutes for each ride that you want to ride of waiting. If you want to ride the Star Wars ride, that's their most popular ride now, it's 127 minutes of waiting. Uh, for a ride that lasts about seven minutes, uh, 127 minutes. And it's possible uh, that, that, that that ride could be so fun that, uh, that you forget all about the 127 minutes beforehand. But I don't think I'd forget. I think I'd remember even afterward. And they call it the happiest place on earth, but it, I don't know. I don't know if it is. And it's because of all the waiting. And, and I wish that there was a way to speed that up because when I have to wait, you feel out of control. You feel like you... Like nothing's happening, you're just taking forever, and, and you feel your life crawling by. I remember being a, uh, a, uh, a, a freshman or sophomore, I don't remember that now exactly, but I was at Purdue, and I was studying uh, in the library there. I was in one of the libraries, and somebody had written on the desk in this big pencil. It's really artistic. It took a long time to get it drawn out there, and they'd drawn this thing. They said, if I only had an hour left to live, I'd spend it right here studying for chemistry because then it would seem like forever. And I thought, I thought, man, what a funny thing. And I, and I, I remember uh, feeling like that at the time, you know, uh, that, that, that sometimes time just crawls by. It's just so slow, and you, you hope that it'll move quicker. And then, and then you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then the thing you waited for, it's over just like that. And then it's right back to waiting for the next thing. And if I could, I remember, I think I've mentioned this before in a sermon, uh, Bill Clinton, when he, right after he was done being president, they interviewed him on, on something, and they asked him what he would miss the most about being president. And he said the thing he would miss the most about being president was that when he was president, everything started when he sat down. And I thought that was such an interesting thing. He says, if I go to a nice restaurant, I sit down and the plate's in front of me. As soon as I sit down, they're serving it. If I go to a concert, I sit down and the band starts. I sit down and the movie starts. When I sit down, that's when we get going. And I never have to wait. And I thought, man, wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, even for like one day. And then I started thinking about, what do you think that does to somebody's ego? If you're president for four or eight years, what do you think that does to somebody to get that kind of, tr or, you know, think about it a different way. If, if you had a kid and, and your kid is in, is in grade school and you think to yourself, you know, my gift to my kid is they'll never have to wait for anything the rest of their life. I'm just going to make my life all about making sure they never have to wait. What kind of kid does that produce? I, I just think there's, there's something about waiting that's, that's good for us even though nobody likes to do it. I mean, if I could wave, when I remember watching 
uh, you guys have seen it, the, the Star Trek uh, TV shows or movies, and this idea that you could have Scotty just beam you up, and you'd be here, and then a second later, you're there. And I thought, what a cool technology that is. If I could have any technology from any science fiction thing, that's what I would pick. I'd want that over lightsabers. The idea that you could, you could just be there immediately, what a cool thing that would be. If I, if I was smart, I would invent something like that. I, I just think that's, that's awesome stuff. Because, because, because it would take away that whole thing, right? A feeling powerless, a feeling like time is just crawling, a feeling like you're never going to get it done like you want to get it done. A feeling like life is, is dragging by. And uh, anyway, all that in mind and all that, that thought in mind, I, I, I wanted to talk about waiting. And, and, and specifically, because we're in church here, waiting on God. You know, God has made a declaration or a promise. God promises to give you purpose and peace and power, and now we're waiting. We're waiting for God to come through. God said he'd do it. Let's see what he does. And we wait and we wait and we wait. And it's hard to wait. And there's a temptation that creeps in when you're waiting to go ahead and give God a hand and help him out and just move ahead of God a little bit there. And, uh, and I want to talk about that. That's what this story today is about. This story is about four people, uh, Isaac and Rebecca and uh, Esau and Jacob. And you may know about the story, but just in case you, 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 you don't, uh, Isaac uh, was the chosen uh, kid. His, his mom and dad, Abraham and Sarah, uh, had him very late in life. He was a miracle baby. They never thought they would have him. And then, and then God comes through in a big promise. And God tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you powerfully. And when you die, I'm going to bless Isaac powerfully. And Abraham had other kids, but Isaac was the chosen one. And and again, you wonder what that does to your ego, hearing that all your life. And, and when Isaac was 40 years old, uh, his dad arranged a marriage for him. And, and Rebecca comes into the picture. And the first time that he met Rebecca, they were engaged. And, uh, and uh, she left all her family hundreds of miles behind and came and, and married, uh, married Isaac. And it says he loved her. It never says uh, how she felt about him, but the assumption is that she loved him too. And, and they got along famously and... And, uh, and again, they're going to have a kid too. And one day when they have a kid, that kid will be the kid who gets God's blessing and, and uh, the one big promised blessing that was given to Abraham. But it takes a long time, uh, 20 years. Of she can't have a child. They're trying and trying and trying and nothing's working out. And then one day she's pregnant, but it's a hard pregnancy and uh, it, it, uh, painful. It feels like uh, the, 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 she has twins and the twins are wrestling inside of her all the time. And, uh, and when they're finally born, uh, the first one out is Esau. And it mentions that Esau was uh, red and hairy when he was born, uh, which is kind of an interesting uh, uh, defect there. But, 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 but the, the implication from Scripture is from the very beginning, Esau is a man's man. You know, comes out of the the womb, flexing, and a big dude. I mean, and he grows up to be an outdoorsman and a fisherman and a hunter, and, and uh, he's really popular with the ladies. There's a comment or two about that. And he's, uh, um, he's his dad's favorite. I mean, he's just, he's just, if there was a football team, he was the captain of the football team, and, and, and Isaac was proud to sit up there in the stand and say, see the boy killing your boy? That's my son. And, and was proud of it because Esau was so big. And then the twin was Jacob. And Jacob was not nearly so big, and Jacob was not nearly so tough, and it says that he was more of a quiet man, and he would stay back in the, in the tents, and he wouldn't go out and hunt and do all that stuff. And Isaac loved Esau, and Jacob uh, was loved by his mom, and uh, a, a mama's boy and, and, uh, by, every, by every term. And, and, and that's how they grow up. Now, as parents, you're supposed to tell your kids, I love all my kids the same. And actually, as a parent, you're supposed to strive for that. I think, because if a kid knows that you don't love them that much or don't love them as much as another person, it does weird things to your psyche. It does weird things to, to you, and, and that's, that's hard. And, and you can imagine some weird things were happening with these two boys. Uh, now, I should mention, I've not mentioned yet, God tells Rebecca when the boys are in her womb, when, before they were even born, that he's going to give Abraham's blessing to the younger one. He's going to give the blessing to Jacob. And when Jacob's born, you can imagine mom and dad really are both in agreement with that. But then Esau grows up, and he's such a fantastic dude, you know? He's a bro. 
he's a uh, He's all swole and everything. And, and, and so, and so the, the older he gets and the tougher he gets and the more masculine he gets, the more Isaac likes him. This is exactly the kind of kid I hoped I'd have, uh, this Esau. And, uh, and, and, and he starts maybe wondering if God had the right plan there all along. And that's where the story uh, starts. So it says one day uh, when Isaac was old, and his eyes were, were weak, and he couldn't really see anymore. He calls for Esau, his older son, and he says, I'm an old man. I don't know the day of my death, so you go get your equipment, your, your quiver and your bow, and go out in the open country and hunt some wild game for me and, 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 and prepare the kind of tasty food that I like and bring it to me to eat so I can give you my blessing before I die. Now, now a, a blessing, this is a common thing in that time period. A, a father would try to give a blessing to the kid, but it has more weight here because God has given a very specific blessing to Isaac that Isaac is supposed to pass on to Jacob. But he's not doing it. He calls Esau in. And it's interesting that he just calls Esau in. Normally, you would call in the whole family and make it a big public thing, but he doesn't want to do that. Maybe he knows that Rebecca disagrees with it. Maybe he knows uh, that Jacob already, he knows so he's kind of sneaking around a little bit here, and, and he's going to have, a, just he and Esau are talking, and they're going to work this out, uh, the two of them. Well, Rebecca overhears it, and we don't know if she's just listening all the time, trying to be a sneaky or just happen to be passing by, doesn't say. But either way, she hears them, hears that thing, and she hears what he says to Esau. And so when Esau left for the open country uh, to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca calls Jacob in, and she says, go out to the flock and get me two young goats. And bring them in here, and I'll make tasty food for your, for your father just the way that he likes it. And then you can take it to your father to eat, and, and he'll give you his blessing before he dies. Now, you're learning a little bit about Isaac here. Um, uh, those of you who are deer hunters and, and, and like to hunt deer, uh, wild game tastes like wild game. So Isaac, when he says, I want wild game here, he can't even really taste it anymore. He's to the point where it doesn't really, the main thing he was hoping for is that Esau would go show how tough he was again, and we would have this meal together, and, and we would do it. The, the goats are going to fool him, because so, he can't really taste it. Uh, but it's kind of a high-risk plan, because Esau's this great big uh, dude, and he's hairy and, and, and everything, and, 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 and Jacob sees right away, wait, I can see a flaw in the plan. She says to Rebecca, his mother, he says, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? And I would appear to be tricking him. Then I'd get a curse instead of a blessing. And, she, and the mother says to him, well, my son, let the curse fall on me. You just do what I say, and you go get them for me. So he does. He goes out and gets the goats, and she took the, the clothes of Esau, her older son, and she, she had them in the house, and she put them on her younger son Jacob, and, and she covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skin. Um, and this kind of tells you a little something about Esau. When I say he's a hairy man, I mean, he's a hairy man compared to other hairy men. I, don't, I mean, there's probably, if we had a contest, that one of you would win, hairiest man. We might do that one Sunday, and one of you guys would be the hairiest man in here. But even compared to that dude, whoever that dude is, Esau's hairier. Esau's hairy to the point where you can take goat skin and put it on his neck, and, and a person blindfolded can't tell what they're rubbing. He's, he's that kind of hairy. I mean, like a goat. It's like a, a Pepsi challenge, but with goats, and you're feeling the hair, and it's like, okay. And that's the plan. And it's a good plan. It works. That part of it does. The, the skins f uh, fool him. He goes to his father, and my father, who is it? And he says, it's Esau. It's Jacob talking. He's Esau, your firstborn, I've done like you asked me, please sit up and eat some of the game, give me your blessing. And Isaac asked him, well, how'd you get the game so quickly, my son? Well, the Lord your God gave me success. And he's dump, jumping deeper into the lie is what he's doing. And Isaac says to Jacob, well, come near so I can touch you, my son, see if you're really my son Esau or not. And Jacob went close and he feels it. And it does fool him. He says, well, the, vo the voice is like Jacob, but the hands are like Esau, which again, just a Sasquatch is what he was, and, and, uh, and, uh, and he's really, really hairy. And so Isaac can tell the voice doesn't sound right, doesn't sound like Esau, but, but he's, he doesn't know. And then his father says, come near, my son, and give me a kiss, like on the, on the cheek there. And so Isaac, when he comes near, Isaac catches the smell of Esau's clothes. And that's what does it. That's what lets him know, okay, I see what's going on. Now, I know we're in a pre uh, Tide era here. We're in a pre uh, uh, before uh, modern soaps and stuff like that. But Esau must have been a, a must have been a pretty big musk around Esau, right? 
you just get a little whiff of his clothes was enough to let you know, oh, okay. And then he says this line here, which I don't know totally what this means. Uh, this smell of my son's like the smell of a field, the Lord's blessed. Like you smell like outdoors, which I'm not sure it's a good or bad thing. But again, tells you a little bit about who Esau is. You know, oh, I just get a little whiff of you. I can tell you're my boy. And so he gives him the blessing. And the blessing is, is this here. He says, may God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May the nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. May you be Lord over your brothers and, and the sons of your mother uh, who bow down to you. And may those who, who curse you be cursed, and may those who bless you be blessed. Which is the Abraham promise. He's given him the promise that Abraham uh, was given, that was given to Isaac. He's given that now to, to Jacob, though he doesn't know he's given to Jacob. He thinks he's given to Esau. Well, no sooner had uh, Jacob finished uh, you know all that Isaac blessed him and Jacob left well then Esau comes back in from hunting and he prepares the food and father asks him well who are you well I'm your son I'm your firstborn Esau and it says Isaac trembled violently uh, he really it shook him it, it uh, uh, he goes well who was it then that that hunted game and brought it to me I ate it just now for you came in and blessed him and he will be blessed now, this is kind of a curious thing here, too, because you would think that Isaac could say, oh, I see, I was tricked. Well, I take it all back. Now I'm going to give it to you. But he doesn't do that. And I don't know, I read a couple of different things. Maybe it was just custom, that once it was out there, it was out there, and you couldn't take it back. But i got to wonder if Isaac is starting to wonder, okay, maybe God's in this somehow. You know, Isaac's trying to pull a fast one on God, and now he's been fooled. And I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing, but he, he doesn't think he can go back on it. Once it's said, it's said, and, and this shakes Esau pretty badly. And it says he, he, he says to his father, do you only have one blessing? You know, is there, there's nothing for me? And Esau wept out loud, and, and Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of all this. Um, and he said to himself, and, and apparently said it to lots of people because his mom's going to hear about it. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my brother are near, he'll die. And I'll kill Jacob. And uh, his mom does hear about it. So he's telling folks. And she calls Jacob in and says, your brother is comforting himself by, by planning to kill you. And, and so she says, go to my brother. And remember, he's hundreds of miles away. It was an arranged marriage. You go to my brother in, in Haran and you stay with him for a little while till your brother's fury goes away. And this notion, I think she hopes it'll be a week or two and he'll come right back, but he doesn't come right back. He's gone for 20 years. Uh, I've known some people in my life, maybe some people even in here, I don't know, maybe there's people in here who have seen their family split up like this. One person's hurt so bad and they go the other direction, or one person does something so bad that the others say, you need to leave, and, and, they, and that's what happens here. That's what happens here. It's such an ugly awful moment and Jacob leaves and he can't come right back and and probably his mother never sees him again we don't know for sure it, it doesn't mention her again so she she probably dies before she ever sees him again and and the damage that's done to the family here is enormous now I had a friend uh, a couple years ago uh, got on uh, ancestry.com it's an interesting thing most most people uh, don't know that you go back very very far at all in your family line and and most people don't know very much about those people uh, if, if I asked you what your great-grandfather's middle name was most of you would have a hard time coming up with that right off and and it, it's just we, we, we lose those things pretty quick and if you get further back than that you know great-grandfather great-grandmother it can get real foggy and my friend had gotten on this ancestry.com and he had found out that one of his like great 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 grandpas or something like that had been in jail for 20 years and, and had killed a man and, and uh, had kids all over town, just, just a, all this scandal about this guy. And he said, I never knew any of it. Because, because you're not going to keep telling those stories, you know. The stories that make you look bad, th those stories kind of die in a family. You don't keep telling those stories. You tell the good ones, but you, you get rid of the bad ones. And so you're not going to hear it. But So the first thing that's interesting to me, that this, this story about uh, Isaac and, and all that, that it continues that they keep telling this story. I mean, they had to. We've got the story now. So, I mean, they, they just kept telling this story, and nobody looks good in it. Everybody looks bad. Isaac has been told by God a certain thing, but he doesn't want to do what God says. He wants to sneak around God. And, and, and Rebecca, she sees her husband sneaking around God, but she doesn't really trust God to fix it either. She takes matters into her own hands, and she's going to fix it. And uh, Esau, 
he's probably the most innocent of all four of them. He's just a dude hanging out. But, but he sees a chance to get the blessing. He wants to grab it. And Jacob, he's been told by God that you're going to get all of it, but he can't wait on God. He just can't wait on God, and so he grabs it. And the, and the damage that all four of them do, I mean, it breaks their family. I mean, they, they, their family stays broken for, for 20 years. And at the end of 20 years, when they come back, uh, Isaac's not the same guy anymore. I mean, his health was already declining. He's, he's not at all the same guy he used to be. Esau and Jacob make amends at the end of 20 years, but they can't live near one another. And, uh, and mother's gone. I mean, their family never totally recovers from this because they're all trying to help God. And, uh, and I, I think that's probably why the story continued. Not so much because it made the family look bad. It does make them look bad. But that lesson was an important lesson to hang on to. We, when we start trying to help God do the things God wants to do, when we start getting ahead of God, everything falls apart. And and so when we're thinking about lessons from this story, I hope that's the first one. That, that when we try to help God, that's foolish. Now, let's just so we're clear in our terms. I know it's almost the same thing. Like even with evangelism, when you speak up to somebody about Jesus, you're not helping God. You're following God. And you're not saving people. He's saving people. That may be through the things you say, but, but you're not helping God. You're just following God. That's what he's after. You're not trying to do it for him and trying to do it quicker than he can do it. You're just being obedient. And, 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 and as you're obedient, sometimes God's pace may not be your pace. You may do all the right things, and it may not work out just like you want it to work out. And it's hard to wait on God in those moments. I mean, I, I, I know that it is. It's hard to, to ask God to, to come through and wait and wait and wait and I, I, I was trying to think of examples of that. I was in California before we came here, and I was a minister out there. And I'm in my office one day, and I, I hear a guy's voice I don't recognize out there talking to the secretaries. And then one of them comes back to me and says, hey, you've got this guy who wants to see you. And he comes in and introduces him. I hadn't met him before. He had never been to our church. And he said he was just driving down the road, and he saw the church there, and he thought he would come ask me some advice which is a weird thing. It's never happened to me before. You, even for yourself, think about what it would take for you to drive down the road and say, you know what, I'm going to pull into this church I've never been in and just ask the guy advice. It's kind of a weird thing. It's never happened to me before, never happened to me since then. Uh, but, he, but he pulls in, doesn't know me, and says he, he's got relationship problems. And I'm not really a, a Dr. Phil kind of guy for that anyway, relationship problems. But I said, okay, well, you know what's going on? And, and so he starts talking. He said, I got this, 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 this lady and we're so close. Man, it's everything about our relationship seems like it should be awesome. You know, we both really love each other, and, and we're compatible, and, and, and we see so many things the same way, but they just always stress, and it's always hard, and it's always a challenge, and it's always difficult, and I don't understand how it can be both those things. And I'm sure God wants me to be with her, but it just seems like it's hard. And I told him, well, sometimes when it's hard like that, that's the sign that maybe you're not supposed to be to be with her. I, mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't know her, but maybe that's the, maybe it's a sign. No, nah, there's no way. I'm sure she's the one, and, and she's sure I'm the one, and we just can't figure out why it's so hard. And I said, okay, well, what's, what's so hard about it? What's making it so tough for you guys? And he said, well, mainly it's her husband. <laughs> I said, yeah, that'll do it. That'll, 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 that'll do it. So we started talking about this thing. And the weird part is that he wasn't really being, he really didn't see anything wrong with what he was saying, right? It wasn't like he was just trying to get me. You know, there's cameras behind seeing my reaction. He just, he, and, and says, so I mean, the Bible's real clear about this. I mean, and, and God just wants you to follow him. You don't need to wonder about the other part. You just follow God and this other part take care of itself. And God doesn't, God's not going to lead you this direction. I mean, something is leading you there, but it's not, it's not God. I remember as a youth minister, I was in California before here, I was in Tennessee before California, youth minister in Tennessee. And, and as a youth minister, you end up and teach the same topics a lot. You know, you, hopefully well-rounded, but certain topics pop up more than others. And relationships popped up a lot. And I remember one kid in, the, in particular, we're having this conversation, and, and she started dating this, this guy. And, and not only is he not a Christian, but he thinks the whole thing's stupid. They just constantly get in arguments about it. He teases her about her faith. And, there's, and, 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 and why are you dating this guy then? 
you know? And she'd say, she'd, she, would, she would ask me, you think God wants me not to date him? And, and, and obviously, I mean, obviously that's the truth. It's, it's, I mean, the Bible talks about this when we look at the scripture. And she'd say, don't you think I can save him? And, and, the, and the thing is here on this, on this kind of stuff, yeah, sometimes. I, mean, I don't want to say that that's impossible. Sure, that can happen. But I told her, I remember having the conversation. I told her, I can bring 50 people in right now. 50 adults, and they will tell you that the road you're on leads to pain. And that even if you're able to persuade this guy to come around, the road you're on is a painful road. I mean, you're, you're, you're just, you're, it doesn't mean it won't work. It's like Isaac here and Rebecca and all this. You, you know, God's will is going to come through because God is God. But the path you're on by ignoring him on this is a painful path. And I could bring 50 adults right now who would tell you that. And, and her answer was, uh, well, it won't be like that for us. And what do you say, you know? I hope not. And, and uh, that's all you can say. And she's trying to help God. She's found the right one. And yeah, God has these standards and rules, but, but, but she's got a better plan. Or the guy who came to see me, he's... He's got a better plan. And we do that with relationships all the time. We do that by trying to advance ourselves all the time. Uh, uh, Jesus tells a story about a wedding. He says, when you're invited to a wedding, on purpose, take the back seat. You know, take the back seat. And uh, if you take the front seat, somebody more important than you might come in. And they'll drag you to the back, and you'll be real embarrassed. But take the back seat. And then somebody might come along and say, hey, won't you come up here and be honored and think how good that'll feel? I thought about testing that today with Mike. Mike, won't you come to the front here and sit here in the front, and I'll just bring you up here, and you, but I was afraid Mike wouldn't like it, so I didn't, I didn't do it. But, but, the, but the notion, the, the point of it, right, is, is, uh, is if, 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 think of yourself humble, and if somebody wants to come and give you a reward, that'll be awesome, but don't be grabbing at rewards, because you grab a reward, you may not get them, and that'll feel awful, and that's a good lesson. And as Christians, that's not a hard lesson to understand. But it's a hard lesson to apply. Man, it's a hard lesson to apply. If I don't push myself forward, maybe people won't notice. If I don't try to grab some credit, maybe nobody will say thank you. Maybe nobody will care. Maybe nobody will, will appreciate all the things I do. And, and it's just so hard to be quiet. We see it with conflict. When we get real mad, we're not sure that God's way is the right way anymore. My birthday was last week, and my grandsons were in, and they're five and six, the two oldest. And uh, I told them, I said, hey, let's go out to eat. You know, Julia and I and the grandsons, we'll go out to eat. Go anywhere you want, in Bloomington or in, in Bedford. Here, you guys pick. Wherever you want to go, we'll go. Where do you think we went to, to eat? <laughs> they're a cheap date. They're a cheap date. We go into McDonald's, and they're just thrilled. One of the boys danced on one of the benches there. It was, it was, a, it was a big night. And uh, but we're ordering food in the front, and uh, you, if you've not been to McDonald's recently, you can either order with the kiosks there, you can type it in, or you can order at the, at the counter. And if you go to the counter, there's a, like, here you're at the counter, and then right beside you at the counter is where they bring food out, and they might call somebody to come get it. So I'm, I'm ordering, and somebody comes in behind me who had been through the drive through and they burst in the door, they kind of slam it back there, they're mad, and they push their way to the front of this line beside me here. They don't wait, and there's two or three waiting there, and they push in front of those guys, and they say, what kind of idiots we got working back here? Real, real uh, hateful and mean. He says, I, I told you when I ordered my food, I said, I want hot fries. I said it twice. I want hot fries. Feel these fries. And the kid, you know, touches them. says, are these hot to you? No. No. Well, I want new fries. So they gave him new fries. I don't know what y'all are thinking. How hard is it? A bunch of idiots. And he, he said a few other words, and then he, and he leaves. And I'm watching this whole thing go down, and it's like, it makes it so unnecessary, right? Because they don't care. I mean, they don't care. They're making minimum wage. This is not, for most of them, a career choice. You want new fries? Great. I mean, they don't care. They probably gave those fries to me. I probably ate those fries later on. They probably went back in the back and I ate them <laughs> afterward. And I'm with the guy on the cold fries. Cold fries are awful. 
If we agree on nothing else today, can we agree on that? Cold fries are awful. Can I get an amen? Amen. Everybody hates cold fries. I'm with him on the cold fries thing. But when you go in there and you just blow up like this, I mean, if he ever has to be with any of those guys again, they're not going to listen to him because they know what kind of a, of, a, of a guy he is. They know who he is. I mean, you, you've blown every possibility of a witness. And, 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 and it, was, it, was, it was just fool. Why are you yelling at him? Well, because he can Right? I mean, that's the only reason. He wouldn't yell at the policeman like that. He wouldn't yell at the boss like that. He wouldn't yell at his wife like that. Or maybe, or maybe he would. Maybe he would yell at his wife like that. See, I've seen people, I've seen parents sometimes, like, dress their teenager down, like, like, like make fun of them and tease and say awful things to their teenager, things they would never, ever in a million years say to another teenager. Why? Because the other teenager would never talk to them again. But they'll do it to their kid because their kid has to go home with them. And they can. It's awful the stuff we do when we can. And, and if that guy were here, the guy who yells at, him at McDonald's, if he were here this morning... He might catch me afterward and say, I don't think there's any Bible verses about cold fries. And I have to agree with that for sure. That's true. But, but there is a Bible verse about what you're supposed to do unto somebody else. Right? Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And, and I mean, you would never put up with that if one of those kids came and called you an idiot in front of a big crowd. I mean, just, there's just no reason for it. Now, why does he do it then? Well, partly because he can, but partly because he thinks if he goes in there and really blows up, he'll get what he wants. And he did. He did. He got new fries. And like I said, we can all agree, cold fries are an abomination. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm but it's, it's just not worth it. And, and if he had come in there meek, maybe he doesn't get what he wants. Maybe he's not sure God's way is really the best way. And it feels good to be mad. It feels good to be mad, and it feels good to get the last word. It feels really good to get the last word. Go in there and yell real hard. The other person has to just take it, and you walk away. That feels good. It's just sin. And it's all us trying to control the story, and, and we're not meant to control the story. It's been a couple of years ago, but I was in a gym, and there was two guys working out at the gym, and they were both just gigantic guys. They were the kind of guys that I kind of hated to work out around because they were just big, big, right? I mean, a swole, muscle-bound, and huge dudes. And they're, and they're both pushing one another, right, to, to just do more and more and more weight. And they, they had this thing they were doing where they, they loaded up the, the bar with, with, a, with, with a tens, and, and, and five, just all the way out to the end, like at, at tens all the way out to the end, and they would do as many as they could, and they would take ten off of each side and do as many as they could immediately and take ten off. And so at the end, it's just the bar and these gigantic dudes, and they're, ah, and they're squeezing the bar up, and they're just killing each other, and the, and the whole gym could hear them, ah, and then one guy, come on, you got it, you got it, you got it, and they're, and they're, they're pushing up. And, I, and you can't help but notice these dudes in the gym and and this commercial comes on in the radio that we're doing it talks about how you can take this pill and lose weight and one guy starts laughing what are we doing this for man we just take a pill and lose and lose weight and it's a weird thing because because we like to think there's a shortcut somewhere we just got to be smart enough to find the shortcut right and the ancient world didn't really think like that the ancient world knew the main things were were, were figuring out what reality was figuring out who god was and and, and get yourself in line but the modern world doesn't think that way at all. Sometimes we think there, there's a trick. And we can get smart and work around God, and we don't have to do it the way he wants it done. And we can, we've evolved. And I hope the first lesson, the big lesson you get out of that story is when we try to go around God, God will still get done what he wants done because he's God. But the toll on us is awful. And the second thing, and I'm not going to talk about this nearly as long, it's, it's my second uh, bigger point. Uh, God choosing you has nothing to do with your performance or your talent or whether you were your parents' favorite child. Uh, God chooses Jacob because he loves him. And that's the only reason. 
I mean, he doesn't pick him because he's so smart or because he's so talented or because he's so tough. He picks him because he loves him. And, and, and the reason why God picks you is because he loves you. And that's the only reason. But b- before you ever did anything for God, God chose you. You, you didn't lay your life down for him. He lays his life down for you. And, and he shows us what love is. And, and, and whether or not you're the favorite child or the black sheep, whether, whether or not you're super talented and can perform well, or, or whether or not you have all the gifts, it was never those things that made God love you. He loved you because you're you. And he chose you before you were born come and be with him. I think sometimes as Christians, we we know this promise that God has given us that he's going to be there for us and give us purpose and peace and and power and 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 if we'll just stick with him. This life we've always wanted, it's right there, but it's so hard to trust God when I'm mad or when I'm lonely or when I don't have everything like I want it right in that moment. And in those times when I'm tempted to sneak ahead of God, it's really important that I remember that God chose me first. And that if I will rest in what He is and what He's done and and what He provides, I'll have a more blessed life than if I try to do it myself. And I hope when you're thinking about this sermon today, I, I hope that's a lesson you can take out of here. So I'm going to pray with you here at the end. And uh, if anybody in here uh, needs to pray about, well, about anything, there's some people in the front who will pray with you and and lift you up. Um, You can pray certainly with the people who are around you there in your your pew and and talk to one another and pray pray there too. But, But take advantage of this time. God's not done with you. God still has a plan. I, I, I just promise that he does. And God still has big things he wants to do with you. So draw close to him. Let's, let's pray. Dear Lord God, I, I, uh, I do thank you, God, for anybody in here who feels distant from you, who feels like uh, their life is crawling by in a wrong direction. I pray, Father, that you put your hand on them. And for anybody here, God, who, who does feel some distance, and it's a distance that they've, they've contributed to, they've, uh, they've walked away from you, then I pray, God, you give them the courage to start walking back. And, and help us to know, God, that the trip back is so short, it's just one step. It's just, it's just agreeing and saying out loud that we want you to be in charge again. And if there's anybody here, God, who's looking for that, then I, I pray you hear that prayer and that you answer it. In Jesus' name, amen.